Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to you all, and thank you all very much indeed for coming along here today. Before I begin my talk this afternoon, let me just briefly remind you about the offer that I always like to give to cruise guests, because I hope it's helpful. Quite simply, if you have any questions that arise from this afternoon's talk or my previous talks, please don't be shy with me, but instead always feel free to ask those questions whenever you see me around the ship, morning, afternoon, or evening, or if you see me out and about on shore excursions. But if you have any burning immediate questions right after this talk, I can't take them anywhere near this stage because the guys have to change this stage set, but I can take them right after the talk, right outside the theatre. So that's for any Im immediate questions. But ladies and gentlemen, whenever we first encounter Norway's beautiful and fascinating northern forest, I think initially at least we can be forgiven for thinking they look completely unpromising because often uh, in paralyzingly cold temperatures there often seems to be just endless snow and ice of the same kind of trees going on forever with perhaps only the sound of biting wind which seems to cut right through you unless you're dressed for the occasion but of course so often in life appearances can be deceptive can't they and today I want to try and convince you ladies and gentlemen that the forests of the far north north of Norway really are a completely fascinating and extraordinary environment, which, if we're dressed warmly and appropriately, they can repay any amount of time and effort we can give to those forests. So let's ask an important question about these northern Norwegian forests, shall we? What exactly are we looking at when we look at this beautiful, endless expanse of trees? Well, I can tell you that the forests of northern Norway are part of the largest expanse of forest anywhere on our planet. And although, yes, I can make that extraordinary statement, if you look at the, uh, the, the slide on my map, you, you'll see that the northern Norwegian forests really are part of a global forest system. But that phrase that I use, the largest expanse of forest anywhere on the, this planet, that is quite a statement for me to make, isn't it? So what we're confronting when we think about the forests of northern Norway is an area of forest that is a part of a greater forest area that is larger than the Amazon rainforest, ladies and gentlemen. It's larger than any of the tropical forests of Central Africa and is most certainly larger than any forest that we would find in Southeast Asia. So in terms of its vital statistics, the belt of forest that I'm showing you and within which uh, the Norwe Norwegian northern forests are a very important part, have, uh, stretch around the high latitude Attitudes of planet Earth about 6,200 miles. And in places, that belt of northern forest is about 1,200 miles from north to south. So in other words, the uh, northern uh, forests of N Norway are part of an extraordinary natural wonder. So if we keep that map in the back of our minds, let's now think about the northern limits to this, uh, this forest belt. And certainly the north of these uh, beautiful forests, there is tundra. In other words, a treeless expanse of dwarf shrubs, sedges, grasses, mosses and lichens. And as a point of interest to you, um, that word tundra, which language does it come from? It comes from the language of the Kil in Sami language, the people, in other words, of Lapland. Their word tundra literally means uplands or the, the treeless mountain tract. And the reason why the tundra begins to run out and the forests of the north begin is be really because there is a very small increase in the amount of light which is available to plant life. So really, nearer to the North Pole, the summers are so short that the trees do not have enough growing time in the year to build a tree trunk. And at the same time, those tundra summers are not long enough uh, to give a tree enough time to grow its own leaves, which are tough enough to withstand severe frosts before the winter returns. So the northern limit of the northern uh, forests of Norway and the no this northern uh, forest belt always coincides with at least 30 days in the year 
year when there's enough light uh, for trees to grow. And where there is also at least 10 degrees Celsius, or 50 degrees Fahrenheit if you prefer, within those 30 days per year. But having said that things get a little bit brighter and a tiny bit warmer for just 30 days each year, let us make no mistake, ladies and gentlemen, about what it is like for the rest of the year. Because we are talking about a parts uh, of, of Europe where temperatures go down to minus 40 degrees Celsius, which coincidentally is also minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So these temperatures, you don't just experience them as cold, you experience them as raw or savage pain. Believe me, I've done that research for you. There are heavy blizzards which cover the ground with snowdrifts, which are three or four times my height. And those snowdrifts will stay in the forest for at least half the year. Or if you want me to express that cold in another way, it is so bitter that it literally freezes the liquid which is within the tree's tissues. So that's, uh, the, the, the freezing really denies the trees the essential resource that they need to survive. And that resource, of course, is water. So isn't it ironic, isn't it interesting that water, of course, lies all around these trees in massive snow drifts and huge icicles at least as tall as me, but it's all beyond the reach of the plants and trees. So in a very real sense, in a surprising sense, the trees of northern Norway have to endure a form of drought, which is as ex extreme as any other kind of uh, drought that a desert plant would have to experience. That is a surprise, isn't it? So clearly what I'm saying is we're dealing with some pretty fascinating trees this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So let me pick out uh, one at uh, random. We'll brush off the ice crystals and we'll have a, a look and see what we can see uh, within the, the, the pine needles. So what is it about pine needles that... Um, really uh, helps the, the, the tree to withstand temperatures of minus 40 Celsius or minus 40 Fahrenheit. Well, the first thing, that having a, a leaf which is uh, formed in a long, thin needle makes it very difficult, initially at least, for snow to settle on it. So the tree uh, has to, uh, is able to stay free from snow and ice for longer than um, broadleaf uh, trees. Secondly, if we were to take a slice through the pine needle and put Put that slice under a microscope, a powerful microscope, we would see that they actually contain very little sap. Those, those uh, pine needles contain very little sap. Now think about the logic there. It, with with a, a leaf that has very low levels of sap, there's a very low chance of anything freezing inside the pine needle, isn't there? So now let's, let's think about the dark colouring of the pine needle. And we certainly know that um, Dark colours, uh, of course, uh, absorb as much heat as possible. So that, that's a, a, a competitive advantage from the very feeble sunlight which stretches across the northern Norwegian forests. Now, I have to admit that all green plants inevitably lose some uh, amount of water during the process of growing. And this uh, loss of water actually takes place during the exchange of gases within the tree as it absorbs carbon dioxide from the air and from which it uh, releases oxygen uh, along with its uh, daily uh, uh, waste products from the tree. And that loss of water takes place through tiny pores, uh, which I, I'm showing you on the slide here, called stomata. But the good news about having pine needles as leaves, uh, with, with the shape of the pine needle, it uh, greatly reduces the amount of water lost uh, compared to uh, other broader shaped leaves. So a pine needle has far less stomata within its makeup than broader uh, leaves. And those stomata pores, uh, which uh, the uh, pine needle does have, are located at the bottom of tiny pits. Uh, which are in regular lines along the bottom of grooves which long run the full length of the pine needle. And if we were to analyse what goes on in those tiny grooves, we would actually find, perhaps surprisingly, they hold a tiny pocket of air, still air, of course, which is right above where the stomata pores are located. So with that very clever mechanism within the pine needle, the loss of water vapour is actually kept to an absolute 
remote minimum. And beyond even that clever mechanism, the pine needles have a very thick waxy coating. Uh, so water loss through the cell walls of the pine needle is kept virtually to nothing, very, very low levels. And when conditions are, are just at their most severe during the, the deep midwinter, uh, so that the ground surrounding the trees completely freezes over, the supply of water to the tree's roots can actually be cut off. Uh, and the, the stomata uh, in, in the, the, uh, the pine needles can even switch off uh, what, what its acti activity does. So the, the, uh, the tree actually goes into a form of hibernation. So when I was saying earlier that uh, these are very clever and fascinating trees, you're beginning to see what I mean by now. But when the minus 40 degree temperatures go on for month after month, ladies and gentlemen, there will be locations when even these clever adaptive mechanisms I've just described for you really are not enough to help the tree to survive. So in those paralyzingly cold, extreme conditions, which are very cold, but don't forget, also very dry as well, we mainly find that it is the larch which survives most successfully in the extreme north of the Norwegian forest. And the method which the larch uh, uses in those extreme cold and extreme dry conditions is to shed all its needles during the fall, or to other Brits in the audience, during the autumn, um, during the fall. So that there's uh, absolutely nothing to allow water within the larch to uh, escape because it's, it's lost all its leaves. And having shed all its pine needles, the, the larch once again can enter into a form of extreme tree hibernation. In other words, the tree will basically switch off all its systems and become virtually inactive until it senses that temperatures are getting a little bit more favourable for it to spark itself into life. But of course, not every tree is as clever as, as the larch. Uh, so other trees in, in the uh, northern forest uh, have to keep their uh, pine needles on all year round. And on average, they keep their needles uh, for about seven years until they shed them a few at a time. So fresh new needles are coming through uh, throughout the, the spring and the summer. Um, but of course, be being able to keep hold of your needles uh, has a considerable competitive advantage for the tree. For one thing, of course, the, the, uh, the, the leaves are already on the tree at the beginning of the growing season, aren't they? So they are all ready to photosynthesize just as soon as there is sufficient light for it to do so. And that is a huge saving for the, the energy budget in the, the, these trees by eliminating to the, the need to grow new leaves each new growing season. But apart from the, the size of, of this uh, extraordinary belt of trees of which the northern Norwegian forests are a part, which goes on right around planet Earth, uh, of course, uh, includes Norway, like, like I said, we have to understand that they, these, these, these uh, trees, the species of trees I'm talking about, are at least 300 million years old. And I tell you that is because that they predate the evolution of any of the flowering plants. So when we look upon a uh, humble-looking fir, cone, we are seeing an evolutionary shape, ladies and gentlemen, that is very ancient indeed. Uh, and it, it is uh, very ex extraordinary. And uh, we, we can see that it's exactly the same shape shared through uh, spruce, of course, hemlock, cedar, fir, cypress, uh, that's how they all distribute their, their seeds. But it is no exaggeration that I can uh, tell you, ladies and gentlemen, when I tell you that the humble-looking pine needle, which is uh, shaped by the, the harsh climate uh, surrounding it, determines to a very large degree the character of the entire forest community, whether it's in northern Norway or anywhere else in the northern forest. Now, although that is undeniably true, it is the kind of bold statement that I really need to explain more carefully, don't I? And, and, uh, because it is so important for our understanding this afternoon of the ecosystems of the northern Norwegian forest. So, shall we take one pine needle? Let's slice it and put it under a pow powerful microscope and see what we've got. I want us this afternoon, please, just to concentrate on the red colouring, because that represents the waxy coating that surrounds the pine needle. And it's from that uh, thick waxy coating that we can trace the importance of the pine needle in contributing so much to the, the nature of the northern forests in Norway or anywhere else in the high latitudes. And the reason 
why this waxy and resinous coating is so important to the entire forest community is that it prevents the needles from decomposing very easily. So when the needles eventually fall from the tree, they remain undecayed on the forest floor for many years on end. And so they form a thick springy mat on the forest floor. And as a consequence of that very slow decomposition of the pine needle, uh, which is caused by the, the waxy coating on their leaves, the nutrients from the, the, uh, the pine needles are very slowly released. So as a consequence, what do you think that the soil composition will be? Well, it's going to be poor and it's going to be acid, isn't it? So that raises another question for us to think about. In such poor acid forest soils, how do the trees reclaim the nutrients from the needles when eventually they are released? Well, the trees do so with a little help from their friends, the fungi, which uh, grow all over the northern Norwegian forest, all over the northern uh, forest belt. And what we need to remember is that the roots of coniferous trees are very shallow, surprisingly shallow and they stretch out from the tree in an extensive network around the tree's bowl very close to the soil surface. And what we find if we carefully dig into the soil is that the tree roots are often located very close to the filamentous fungal hairs, which extend upwards from the fungi into the needles. So it's actually those filamentous hairs of the fungi which break down the pine needles into the chemical substances which the trees need to reabsorb. So if it wasn't for the fungi, ladies and gentlemen, really acting as a go-between, that link would not be made anywhere near as well as it is. But let's think further, shall we? What do you think the fungi get out of the deal? Because they're a go-between, they're like an agent, they're not going to work for nothing, are they? They don't have a union, but they know their rights. So uh, the, well, the, the fungi, actually, what, what they get uh, from the, 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 the tree roots, they get loads of sugars, loads of carbohydrates as well, which the tree roots, of course, they're able to supply in ample measures. And just in case you're wondering, why is it that the fungi can't create their own sugars? They can't, why can't they create their own carbohydrates? Uh, well, they don't have the chlorophyll within their chemical makeup to do so. So basically what I'm saying is the fungi need the trees and the trees, Yes, need the fungi. But of course, if we step into a real forest with real trees, it's more complicated than that. It always is in nature, isn't it? It's what makes nature so endlessly fascinating. So if we were to look at an actual tree in an actual forest, we might find actually up to 119 different species of fungi being associated with a single species of tree. And even th there could be six or seven different species of fungi which are found around a single tree in the forest that I'm talking about. So if that's how the waxy coating on the uh, pine needle is instrumental in shaping the relationship between the trees and the fungi, how do you think that the same waxy coating influences the lives of animals in the northern Norwegian forest? Well, it probably won't surprise you, ladies and gentlemen, that the prospect of munching through a waxy, resinous surface uh, of the uh, leaf is pretty unpalatable to any of the animals you're going to ca come across. So carry Caribou will not touch uh, pine needles. Small rodents really will not eat them either. One or two birds I have heard as anecdotal evidence, such as the, the capercaillie or the pine grosbeck, have on rare occasions been thought to have a look at or sniff at uh, pine needles or trying to eat it, but really on every other occasion. Of course, they would prefer the young, tender shoots, wouldn't they? Makes sense. But the thing which forest animals tend to go for with far more relish is the seeds which are found in the pine cone. I need to tell you about several birds which actually are brilliant at doing that. They are highly skilled and adaptive uh, to the northern Norwegian forest. One of the most fascinating, I need to tell you, are these guys, the crossbill. Crossbill, we, we'd recognise them as being a member of the finch family, wouldn't we? They have two mandibles, but have a look at this guy. The mandibles don't meet, do they? At first sight, frankly, it looks a bit 
weird, really, doesn't it? But think about it. Having crossed mandibles, it's just the most perfect tool to prise out and lever up the protein-rich seeds which it's hunting for within the pine cone. It's a brilliant onboard tool. And uh, not only does the pi uh, cross bill have superbly uh, um, shaped beak, but he has a brilliant work ethic as well. They are always busy scurrying around. And on a good day, a hard-working crossbill can actually collect, and you might uh, be surprised at this, up to a 1,000 seeds a day. That is a good work ethic, isn't it? You'll agree with me, ladies and gentlemen. Here's another bird I need to tell you about, the nutcracker. Nutcrackers are much larger than the crossbill. Nutcrackers are about up to 12 inches long. But their method of extracting uh, seeds Seeds from cones is totally different to the cross mandible cross bill. Uh, what the, the nutcracker does, they basically uh, go root one. Uh, their beak is so strong, their jaw muscles are so strong, they can just crush right into a, a pine cone in a single bite. That is a powerful bite, isn't it? So you can imagine they are messy eaters when they bite in. Seeds go everywhere, all over the place. So the nutcracker can then easily gather them up and a few. A few other animals that I'll be coming to in a moment also gather up the, the, the residue. Another interesting thing about nutcracker behaviour is that uh, they don't eat every seed they come across. Yes, they, they need eat uh, enough seeds to get them through the day, but they've obviously been listening to their parents because they they uh, well they don't save their money, but they save their seeds and they screw uh, the uh, well, they they put uh, the seeds away into cracks of trees which they remember uh, as a stash of food for when winter comes. So just as we were taught when we were younger, save your money, they save their seeds. So it's amazing, isn't it, how nature replicates uh, things. But it's not just birds that feed on seeds. There are mammals as well. Squirrels, voles, and these fascinating creatures, the lemmings. I'll be sa saying a lot more about them later on in this talk. They burrow down through the snow and they try and find as many seeds as they can in the winter uh, forest floor. And uh, as far as vegetation, vegetarians go, they, they tend to feed really as much as they can in summer, trying to put on a, as, as much weight, as much uh, body mass as they can, because they know full well uh, when it comes to, to winter, there's virtually nothing to, 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 uh, to eat. Yes, there, there is the, the, the grim prospect of trying to munch on tree bark or mosses or lichens, but uh, you're not going to get too much out of that as a diet. But if that's how the vegetarian cope. What about the meat eaters, ladies and gentlemen, which live in the northern Norwegian forest? Let's think about these guys, the lynx, the European lynx, very thickly furred, of course, um, but they do okay even in the coldest of winters. The adult male European lynx can weigh anything between 44 and 66 pounds, or if you prefer your weight in stone, that's about five stone. So that's a pretty hefty cat, isn't it? Um, at the shop, Older, they, they will uh, say stand an average of two feet tall, and they'll be about four feet long. They have a, a pretty impressive territory as well. Each adult male, 80 square miles of territory on average. But the lynx always has to do its math very carefully. It has to uh, work out its own energy budget of how much energy it's willing to spend for every chase that it pursues. And if it thinks that it's spending too much energy when it's in hot pursuit, the lynx will often give up a chase in order to conserve its energy for hopefully an easier chase later on. So let's think when it, it chases after perhaps its favourite meal, an Arctic hare. Now, an Arctic hare can zoom off really quickly on a sprint, a, a mazy zigzagging sprint, easily of 200 uh, yards, very, very easily. And that's a lot of energy, isn't it, for the, li for the lynx to think, well, is it worth spending? A a am I making progress or not? So that's a little bit of math which the, the, the lynx ha has to uh, think about. But if the uh, lynx have to be very careful when, when they uh, think about their energy budget, it for small prey, like their favourites of the Arctic hares, what sort of a decision do you think they would have to make if they had to be a bit more ambitious? If they were chasing after a roe deer, well, let's think about this. On the positive side of things, a roe deer carries a lot more meat 
does, doesn't it, on, on their hair. So it's worth being a bit more persistent with because the prize is so much greater, far more meat. So the lynx will be happy to spend more time and more effort on that kind of uh, hunt. And by the way, if the roe deer isn't watching out for being hunted by lynx, it also has to watch out for being hunted by wolverine as well because the wolverine are really skilled at hunting deer. What the wolverine do, they, they uh, chase the uh, deer into a snowdrift. And, of course, what's going to happen, the, the deer is going to flounder around it's much easier than the, for the wolverine to do what it needs to do to the roe deer. But when we think about animals generally, which live in the northern forests, the northern forests of Norway, the northern forests of planet Earth, anywhere around, around us, we notice that these animals tend to be giants of their kind. So the capercaillie, which you'll often see in the northern Norwegian forest, just happens to be the largest type of grouse in the world. The moose is the largest kind of deer in the the world. And the wolverine, which we just met a few moments ago, didn't we, is the largest member of the weasel family. So it's, it's all very interesting, isn't it? You can put that idea to the test wherever you go in, in the, the world. Why do you think that is? Why do you think we find giant forms living in the coldest of all forest conditions? Well, the reason is that if you put a lot of bulk around you, your body, that helps to conserve heat in those extreme conditions. As a point of interest, you also find that uh, animals uh, put on uh, a, a lot of bulk and, and become giants of their form in mountain regions as well. They evolve in that bulky direction to develop as much body mass as possible in order to conserve Serve heat. That's the logic behind it all. But let's now think about uh, life in the, the northern Norwegian forest when spring eventually uh, uh, appears. And uh, what we find is that when winter begins to merge into spring, the length of the daylight available uh, actually dramatically increases. It really is very noticeable. And within all the northern Norwegian forests, this is the time of the year when uh, growth among the trees uh, is as much as possible. So let's have a look at some of the, these new buds in detail, see what they, they, they look like. The first thing to say about the, these new buds is they have just done incredibly well, miraculous uh, to, to survive. The, the punishing winter. How did they manage it? Well, it's all helped to the antifreeze. Yes, I'm not joking. They have their own antifreeze, which is uh, developed around the outer cell walls. And uh, enduring the, the freezing temperatures of the, uh, the northern winters, which can plummet down, as I said, to minus 40 degrees uh, Celsius or Fahrenheit, it's absolutely no problem if you've got this super antifreeze. In actual fact, the antifreeze which we find within these northern Norwegian uh, uh, forests can actually uh, withstand temperatures down to minus 20 degrees Celsius or minus 4 degrees uh, Fahrenheit even without itself freezing. But it still protects the trees even at lower temperatures than that. But of course, in springtime, the winter uh, 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 protection is pushed aside. You don't need the antifreeze so much in, in springtime. But did you also realize that between the forest pine needles on the trees which have survived in winter, there are other forms of life which take advantage of that incredible amount of insulation on the tree just to gain a tiny bit of extra warmth? these creatures I'm telling you about are the caterpillars and their story I really needed to include because it is fascinating. Unfortunately, caterpillars are prey to many kinds of birds in the springtime forests of northern Norway. So we need to, to take a few moments to, to think about guys like the, the, the hawk moth, for example, to see that, yes, they are beautifully coloured, but their camouflage is perfect. It's brilliant camouflage to get uh, uh, see them through. But not every species of caterpillar, of course, is as clever to have evolved with camouflage. So if we look at a totally different type of caterpillar, such as, well, let's think about the pine sawfly caterpillar, we find that they stay together, perhaps surprisingly, in large groups around their home tree. Now, I've got a question for you. Can you think how on earth the caterpillars can be so confident in sticking together? The answer is an interesting story. And it begins when we recognize that the main predators of pine sawfly caterpillars are ants.
So when the ants set out to find uh, pine sawfly caterpillars, the ants, of course, do what ants do. They send out scout ants, don't they, to do a bit of reconnaissance and to see what, where the best and the juiciest caterpillars are hiding. But this is where the story gets really interesting. The pine sawfly caterpillars have a very cunning way of looking after themselves and preventing ant attack. What they do, they begin their defense by chewing up the resin from pine needles, and then they'll store that resin in a special pouch which is located within their gut. And when an ant comes along and finds these uh, caterpillars, the caterpillars then dab some of that resin in the form of a kind of gum on the head and the antennae of the ant scout. Now, picture the scene. Uh, as you might imagine, this completely disorientates uh, the, uh, the, uh, the caterpillars because its head and its antennae are completely uh, covered in this gum. Um, and and uh, th so the, 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 uh, the news just doesn't get passed back to the, the, the main uh, body of ants. But the caterpillars don't just confuse the ant scout, they actually add a little something extra to that, uh, that uh, gum in the form of a chemical compound which is very similar indeed to the same chemical which ants release as a danger signal. So when the worker ants uh, come across a uh, uh, scout uh, ant, uh, and, and the, 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 the ant scout ant gets covered in, in this uh, danger signal, when the, the, the worker ants uh, uh, just keep keep well away from, from the, the scout ant, even when the scout ant goes home. Nobody wants to uh, listen to the good news that there are caterpillars out because the workers just think that there is a danger signal about that scout, scout ant. So once again, the message of that there are pi delicious pine sawfly caterpillars out there all ready to be eaten just doesn't get passed on, or very rarely gets passed on. But the story gets even more interesting than that, ladies and gentlemen, because even if the scout ant does manage to get back to the ant nest with this huge glob uh, of uh, resin on, on its head and antennae. And it still carries on, uh, despite the uh, danger uh, sent, uh, being uh, sent out, well, it still carries a danger signal, so the soldier ants kill it. So the, uh, the great herds of pine sawfly caterpillars just keep on munching away slowly at their favourite leaves. So doesn't it just show you, ladies and gentlemen, do not be deceived by beautiful pastoral scenes like this. In actual fact, landscapes like this in the far north of Norway are the scenes of some of the most ingenious and brutal chemical warfare you'll ever come across. It's an astonishing story, isn't it? I had to include it today. But if that's the kind of activity which goes on up in the trees, what might we find uh, scurrying around in springtime on the forest floors in northern Norway? Well, if we went off on a nature ramble t together uh, it, on the, the uh, northern Norwegian uh, spring forest, we would find evidence very soon of lemmings. And if we were lucky enough to, to come across them, we would probably see them all scampering around the, the mat of needles on the forest floor, and you'd be pretty certain that they would be doing one or both of the, the uh, activities the lemmings just love to do. They love to feast on the almost endless supply of seeds which they would find in the spring, but also breeding too, of course. So let us pause and think about the population dynamics of lemmings and how they really can grow big time because those changes are a really big part of the ecosystems of the northern Norwegian forest in springtime. So let's begin at the beginning by recognizing that an adult male or uh, adult female uh, lemming can produce as many as 12 young in a single litter, okay? She may produce three litters in a single breeding season. But it gets more interesting than that because we need to remember that a young lemmings can be born from the first or even the, the second litter. Um, and they can breed for themselves before the, the next winter steps in. Because after all, lemmings can start to breed when they're still only 19 days old. And they will give birth only 20 days later. So as we go further into spring on, on our imaginary forest hike, 
Well, at first thought, we might anticipate having the, the, the forest knee-deep in lemmings. But, of course, there are controlling factors. Thank goodness. <laughs> Otherwise, it would, would be bizarre. Uh, and, of course, that there are the con controlling uh, factors that, that keep lemming populations within a reasonable limit. One of the most uh, uh, effective controlling factors, of course, as I alluded to earlier, the abundance or the absence of food in the, the forest. Now, as springtime uh, changes, certainly, into summer, we find uh, quite a number of birds which uh, spend their, their time further south also fly up in, in, into the, the, the forest. And among those are the owls. I was discussing owls earlier on with a young lady uh, towards the back. Uh, she was saying that owls are her favourite. And why, why not? The bad news for lemmings when we think about owls, owls are brilliant hunters of lemmings. So really, in, in the uh, summer forest of Norway, this is owl territory, most definitely. And Another controlling factor within the, the population of, of uh, uh, life in, in the, nor the northern Norwegian forest is that uh, birds come along to uh, feast upon all, all the, uh, the different uh, insects that there are in the forest. Red wings are up there, field fares are up there, and other thrushes too. They all head to, to the, the forest. They feed on caterpillars. They feed on uh, insects as well. So warblers are definitely out there. The reason why, why are there, there warblers in, in there? Well, of course, as I said, that they are there to feast upon the insects. Bramble are also there with the same idea on their mind. And of course, while the, these birds are feasting on the summer abundance of insects, they're going to nest, aren't they? They're going to raise their young. And as, as with... Um, the lemming populations, the success of that breeding among the, the birds depends on how much food, pretty much, there is available. So, for example, if in one year lemming populations are not quite as much as they would be in previous year, then the breeding success of owls will also definitely suffer. There is a correlation. And if there are fewer voles than, than the previous year, then the populations of great grey owls uh, will also decline markedly. In actual fact, we've noted, it's interesting really, great grey owls will only lay one or two eggs when vole populations are low. But when vole populations are in abundance, a, a cl single clutch can be up to seven or even eight eggs per great grey owl clutch. But, you know, so far I've uh, restricted myself to just to what is going on in the trees and uh, around uh, around on the forest floor. This morning, a group of cruise guests asked me, could I say something about the northern lights, big, which we might see ab above uh, the, the forest? Um, I will just talk briefly. I know time is against me. I believe there is another excellent talk on the uh, uh, northern lights coming up. But because I've been asked to do so, I will talk briefly about this. Uh, perhaps is it to whet your appetite about the excellent talk coming up on that. Um, where would we see the northern lights? Well, really within... Uh, uh, we, we, if we're in the northern uh, forest, uh, look, looking up at night, between uh, latitude 65 and 72 degrees north. Um, mainly visible between October and April. They happen all the time, but in terms of being visible, that, that's when, when they, they, they can be seen by us. Um, th where, they, where do they take place? In the thermosphere. So we are seeing that, the, that one of the greatest displays of lights anywhere on planet Earth. Thermosphere between 53 uh, miles above our head and 370 miles above our head. So it outdoes anything that Vegas could possibly show us, or even Disney World, Disneyland. It really is e extraordinary. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, light show up there, 53 miles above our head, up to 370 miles above our head. But how do the uh, northern lights get themselves created? Well, it's part of an extraordinary natural process. It doesn't start anywhere near on, on planet Earth. It actually starts when a particle, charged particles, are sent over in our direction from the sun. It's called the solar wind. But although those particles are from the sun fly off in all directions away from the sun, when they come anywhere near planet Earth, they are channeled into our upper atmosphere by the magnetic field which surrounds planet Earth. Some of those uh, particles will be electrons, others will be protons, and they get pulled uh, down I into our upper atmosphere. And it, there's an extraordinary amount of energy going on there. As these uh, channeled uh, particles get themselves mixed up with oxygen and nitrogen in our atmosphere. And then we find that some of the oxygen and nitrogen uh, atoms gain an electron, others lose an electron. So scientists call that process of gaining or losing an, an electron 
ionization. So that's all going on above our heads. And uh, when we uh, think about uh, the, the uh, northern lights, if we see greenish colors or brownish colors, those tend to be associated with chemical processes involving oxygen. And at the other end of the scale, when we see beautiful uh, blues and, and uh, reds like, like this, we so, uh, they tend to be involving processes with nitrogen uh, uh, atoms. So there is an extraordinary um, amount of energy, an extraordinary uh, amount of fascination up there. But uh, I will say to people, you don't need to have any uh, knowledge of the science just to look above your heads when you're in these forests or any, anywhere between the 65 and 72 degrees of latitude and just to marvel at what we see. Now, I know we've only had 45 minutes together. I hope what I've done in this 45 minutes is to whet your appetite to learn more about the northern forests of Norway, the northern forests of planet Earth. For me, though, it's been an absolute pleasure to share all these forest stories with you. And I really appreciate the time you've given me today and for listening to my talk. So thank you all very much indeed.